I think this idea that being a mystic only comes from a kind of religious, spiritual world is something that needs to be reconsidered in the light of Nema Akhtim. She's very much influenced by many different things, political movements, scientific movements, and also spiritual movements. And they all come together in her work and in her life and shape the way she paints and the way she thinks. Hi, I'm Kate Brown, and this is The Art Angle, a podcast from Artnet News where the art world meets the real world, bringing each week's biggest stories down to earth. Speaking of touching down on earth, the Swedish painter Hilma Afklund is known for paintings that seem otherworldly on many levels. And yet she died 80 years ago in relative obscurity. You might not realize that if you look her up today. Her paintings, which are large-scale and vivid symbolic abstract masterpieces infused with mysticism and spirituality, they seem uncannily contemporary. But that's not the only reason you might be surprised. Hilma Afklund is now a bona fide star, a new household name in the art world. In the past several years alone, there has been an explosion of interest in her work catalyzed in no small way via her 2018 Guggenheim show in New York, called A Pioneer of Abstraction. It is a fitting title, Afklint's body of work, which bravely departed from the figurative art that was popular at the turn of the 20th century when she was working, predates some of the first Western abstract compositions that we knew by titans like Wassily Kandinsky and Piet Mondrian. It was a staggering revelation, to say the least. But moving beyond the elevator pitches and the catchphrases that have emerged around Afklint as we rush to fit her into an art historical canon that has woefully excluded women is essential. Up until recently, many of the intricacies of her life, her work, her ambitions and friendships were not well understood. That is part of the reason why Julia Voss decided to write the first ever biography on Afklint, which came out in English towards the end of last year. Voss, a prominent German journalist, art critic, researcher, and curator, spent the better part of the last decade learning Swedish and meticulously retracing Afklint's life and movements throughout Europe. Voss combed through more than 20,000 notebooks that belonged to Afklint in her massive archive, the one which the artist had left to her nephew when she died. The biography includes several revelations about Afklint's inner life, desires, and artistic activities. We are headed into another two years that is sure to bring increased attention and reflection on the work of Afklint. Her massive catalog resume is due out next month, edited by Swedish curator and art critic Daniel Birnbaum. An exhibition called Swedish Ecstasy is opening at Bozar Center for Fine Arts in Brussels this week. And next year, for the first time ever, there will be a show dedicated to Kandinsky and Afklint, curated by Birnbaum and Voss. And so I'm very pleased to be joined today by Voss to dive into some of the more fascinating and under-considered aspects of this enigmatic and groundbreaking visual artist. Hi, Julia. Thank you for joining me on The Art Angle today. Hi, Kate. Thank you for inviting me. I have been devouring your book over the past couple of weeks. Before we get started, I wanted to say that I really thoroughly enjoyed reading it. You're a vibrant storyteller, but also a rigorous journalist and researcher. So that combination made the book truly gripping. Wow, thank you. So throughout it, you really set the scene in Europe and in particular in Sweden, where Helma F. Klint spent most of her life crossing, you know, the late 19th century into the 20th century. And your vivid descriptions really describe an art world and a society that is like bursting with change and revolution. What really struck me about it was also how sexism in the public sphere and Mm. in the art world was so extreme. So this is kind of Afklint's Europe. I was hoping you could expand on this for me and explain just how difficult it was for her to garner attention in the art world, but also just as a citizen. Where to start? I mean, sexism is a good point. You know, I expected it when I was researching it, but I didn't expect it to be so outspoken. So in the 19th century, nobody even tries to hide it. So even at the academy where she is studying, there are a lot of male artists who are completely despising their fellow female students. And they're very open about this. For example, Karl Larsson talks about it and he says things like that the women should be removed again and that in all his time at the academy, he had never seen a female artist who is really an artist and so forth. So that's one discourse that's very dominant. The other one comes from the sciences. Medicine is also very hostile against particularly bourgeois women and the question whether they should have an education and go to work and they all deny it and they have the idea that it would make them sick. And sort of the biggest concern is 
that <laughs> it would make them infertile. And so they couldn't have children anymore. So that's the medical and artistic discourse around this in Sweden, but all over in Europe. At the same time, it's a time of change. So there are a lot of political revolutions and reformations and also scientific revolutions. So I think one movement that's very important for him, Art Klint, happens in the world of science. And that's the discovery of all kinds of invisible forces. Think of X-rays, think of radioactivity. And then the strange thing happens that one of the persons who is receiving the Nobel Prize back then is Marie Curie, a woman. And that's kind of a game changer in everything. And Alf Klint lives in the city in Stockholm that awards the Nobel Prizes and is very close to that movement. And I would claim that this is also important for her. That's quite interesting to hear because also that is another important maybe revision to the sort of big narrative that everyone knows about her, which is that she was a mystic, but she was also, for her mysticism, was very much grounded in science, right? As you said, and this really causes a certain rereading of her paintings. Yeah, I think without this scientific revolution, her artwork wouldn't look the same. It's really something that she follows closely. She's not the only artist who follows these developments closely. Also, for example, Kandinsky is someone who's very much interested in that. And science in those days opens up a completely new way to look on the world and to sort of re-evaluate the power of invisible energies and forces. And that's something that shapes her. She also works at a veterinary institute in Stockholm together with Anna Cassell, her friend, very close friend, also an artist, um, collaborator. I think they're very close to all the scientific movements that happen at these days. I think this idea that being a mystic only comes from a kind of religious, spiritual world is something that needs to be reconsidered in the light of Nima Afkin. She's very much influenced by many different things, political movements, scientific movements, and also spiritual movements. And they all come together in her work and in her life and shape the way she paints and the way she thinks. Right, of course. In the book, you also describe the telephone and there's moving images coming mm. out. I mean, it makes so much sense that there would be speculation that at some point you could sort of speak with the spirit world. And then, of course, avant-garde people who were actually trying to do it, as Hilma was. So maybe let's talk a little bit about that. Throughout the book, you really have a lot of quotations from these visitations that she was having. And there were these women-only gatherings where they were having seances and things like this. She never painted alone, really. So can you kind of talk about who these people were that were visiting her from the spirit world and how did they inform her paintings? And I'm actually curious how you interpret these visitors that were coming to her. Yeah, she's never alone. <laughs> she works in a collective of women. So she's always surrounded by her friends, sometimes also lovers. And then she's visited by spiritual forces, spiritual voices that inform her. And in the beginning, I was a bit Put off by that, I have to say, because coming from art history and also from journalism, I didn't know how to deal with that. I didn't know how to research that. And for that, the only source are her notebooks. And then, and also I thought, you know, here we have a female outstanding artist and she's channeling the stuff she's doing. I wanted to have a kind of self-confident avant-garde woman who sort of defines what she's doing rather than being told what she's doing. And then when I read her notebooks, I realized, oh no, you know, it's different than I thought. It's a dialogue. She's in dialogue with these forces. And they're more like invisible friends. They support her. They make offers. They ask her whether she wants to do this. And then she says yes. And then she does it. And they support her in all kinds of ways. And I think that's a very different situation from being told what to do or being commissioned. So I think that's the one important thing to understand. They have all kinds of beautiful names. They're called Amalia. They're called Ananda after Buddha's favorite pupil, Georg, Gregor, Esther. And they visit her throughout her life. So until her very last days, these voices are with her. She starts out in a collective called The Five. They start meeting in the mid-1890s. And then she breaks off with her friend Anna Cassell to do the sort of big art work, the cycle of the paintings for the temple. And a new collective is also then being formed, which is called the 13. And that collective will stay there until the end of the 1910s, I would say. And the interpretation is a difficult question. I think in the beginning, I thought, oh, maybe 
that gives her an opportunity to do something she wasn't allowed to do by a society where sort of the artwork would say, no, this kind of old painting is nothing for a woman, where science would say women are not made to be geniuses and where religion would say you're not supposed to talk to any other spiritual forces than the Christian God and please do that with the priest together. So my first interpretation was that it's kind of cover up of something else. But the more I read it, the more I think I was ready to accept that this is completely her reality and that I should not judge it. And the only thing I can do is sort of hand it on as it is. It certainly sort of in effect and function, it enabled her to do a lot of things she was not supposed to do. Who am I? I'm an agnostic. So I'm not denying the reality of that. The only thing I'm trying to do is sort of pass it on. And in terms of storytelling, it's a beautiful thing. These invisible friends that surround her are, I don't know, beautiful and, I don't know, rich contribution to her story, I think. And I mean, not so foreign to the idea of genius, right? Which is that any artist feels sometimes that they're just driven by some genius force and they can't always explain what it is. Yeah, no, absolutely. A friend of mine was just saying recently, because usually we just assume that everything that's in our head sort of comes from within us. But how do we know? Often we have ideas and we think they just came up and we have all kinds of metaphors of how to describe how they suddenly were there without us knowing how they shaped. And I think in a way, this friend was very right in saying, we just assume that these thoughts we have in our heads are ours, but maybe they're not. How do we know? They might also come from somewhere else, like dreams or whatever. So I think that's very much the case for Emma of Clint. For her, her creativity is not a black box in the sense that she can't account for it. She can account for it because she says sort of it's these invisible forces that speak with me. But in a way, she cannot account for the invisible forces. She's always searching for an explanation where they come from and what kind of system they belong to and what kind of religion in a way that could be. But I think that's also beautiful that it's not a fixed system, that she has the feeling that they also remain kind of uncontrollable and that they don't belong to any ideology or religious system, but they are very open network of things that occur to her. And in line with what you were saying about looking to the future, looking into the spirit world to kind of deal with the maybe oppression of the present society. Mm -hmm. In a lot of her paintings and also in the visitations, there was a lot of discussion about new eras of art, but also new eras of what it means to be male and female, like new definitions. I found this so contemporary. I mean, she, she spoke about androgyny and new gender roles and role reversals. As I understand, and I think you navigate this in the book very delicately, like she also didn't observe traditional gender roles in her personal life as well. Can you speak a bit about that? That was a big theme for her and also her friends and lovers around her. And I think if you look at the paintings, you see a lot of allusions to all kinds of queer symbologies of men turning into women, of all kinds of sexual organs, of mating processes, inseminating, all kinds of connections are being made all kind of crossovers are being made. I think one important thing is together with her friend, Anna Cassell, she forms what she calls a dual being, which is called Vestal Asket. Very strange. But basically it says it has a female and a male part. And together they form something new, something that is bisexual or has two sexualities. And that is kind of the powerhouse in the beginning of the painting. So this overcoming of Duality is something that drives everything and is very important for her. You know, I was wondering, looking at the painting, I was wondering, ha, is that sort of something that only happens in the paintings or is that something that also happens behind the paintings? And the notebook is very clear that they talk about gender roles and all that also among them. And this collective of women, they are really world builders. I think they really transform everything and they set a completely new agenda. There's also a notebook by a woman called Sigrid Lansen, who lives for Hilma Aftent and her mother for many years. And she records also visiting Hilma Aftent in her bed, hugging her, kissing her. So I think that's pretty obvious then that they also have a kind of physical, sexual relation. So I think it was a kind of queer cosmos was also a lived reality for them. Not allowed in society at all, right, at the time, nor was having seances. Yeah. She was quite a bourgeois woman. Does her status in society allow for her kind of avant-gardism on all these fronts in a way? 
To a certain degree, yes, because Pema Aptin was born to a noble family. So they were noble, but they still were working in the military. So they didn't have a castle or a big estate. They had a small estate on a small island. So when her father died in the late 19th century, Hilma Afkin kept on living with her mother. And later on, in 1918, she moved to an island called Munsu, where she had a small summer house and later on also a studio, which she had built with her female friends. And I think that allowed them to live how they wanted to live because, you know, it was kind of a remote place. They could define the rules by which they wanted to live their lives. So in a way you need, as Virginia Woolf has also put it, you need not only a room of oneself, you might also need, I don't know, a house or an island of oneself to be really free. So I think a certain monetary background is important for that. Nevertheless, Emma Upkin had a very simple lifestyle and she had a lot of trouble with money, but she had a family that would support her. And although she lived in a simple summer house with a simple studio attached and everything, it was important for her to have that in order to create this new kind of world that she inhabited with her friends. And also one of her closest friends, Anna Kassel, whom I've already mentioned, who was also a trained painter, she had inherited a lot of money and she was able to support certain things they did. So, yes, I think the bourgeois background gave them a certain degree of liberty. And I also think for women to live together was easier than it was for men back then. But still, I mean, as you also said, these seances, they were kind of fashionable around 1900. And then they came out of fashion. And then I think a lot of people saw that kind of thing with suspicion. And if you were really unlucky, you were taken to a mental asylum. And that was really fatal for a lot of women. Fortunately, Hilma Afkind had a family who would not interfere with her kind of lifestyle and not interfere with also her way of practicing spiritual seances. I want to get in a minute to like talking about her contemporary rediscovery in the past decades. After she died, she sort of went into relative obscurity. Your book busts a lot of myths, so to say, about her life. And one of them was also that it's popularly known that she didn't want her paintings to be shown. So she had this figurative practice and then she was doing this pioneering abstract art before anybody else, basically, but that she kept it private. But what's quite poignant from your book is that that's actually not the case. She was actively Mm. trying to get shown. And in a way, it struck me as, again, an eraser of the sexism that was going on. Mm -hmm. Like She wanted to be respected. She wanted to be shown. And it's too simple to just say, oh, she just was happy to send this off to the future. Absolutely. Yeah. I think she put a lot of energy in that. What's exciting is that she employed a lot of different strategies. So one thing is that she looked for spaces where she could exhibit her spiritual work. I mean, she was trained as an academic painter and she was used to exhibit her academic paintings. And when she, in 1906, sort of embarked on this new work together with her friend Anna Kassel, she found it much more difficult to find an audience for that. And the first time she exhibited spiritual works, I'm not sure whether it was already sort of her abstract works, because we only have the titles and it's kind of unclear. The first year she exhibited them was in 1913 in the context of a spiritual society called Theosophical Society. And then came World War One, so that limited what could be done. And then I think she decided that Dornach in Switzerland, the place founded by Rudolf Steiner, the Theosophical Society, would be the perfect place to show all that. And so one thing is that she tried to exhibit her work there. Never really happened. But the other strategy she employed, I think, is so exciting, is that she put something together, which I call the museum in a suitcase. So she made very small reproductions of her large, big scale, wonderful, beautiful paintings that she glued into 10 albums so she could carry them with her. And the entire idea is that you have a small museum of yourself that you can travel with and show to other people. And she went with this to Dornach in Switzerland. She went with this to Amsterdam. And she also managed to show works in London in 1928. 
but it looks like she didn't get a lot of responses. So after that, she decided she wouldn't put any more energy in that, but instead sort of dedicate her work to the future. And we should not forget by then she was almost 70 years old. So for a long time, she was trying to find an audience for that. And eventually she did. I guess it was in 2013, right? Where she sort of got that big show in Sweden. And then, of course, the big blockbuster show at the Guggenheim, which felt like, Mm. you know, a metaphoric bomb went off in the art world. And all of a sudden, like, she became a household name. I'm curious how the rediscovery process actually was, though. Like, it obviously didn't start in 2018. Can you Mm -hmm. explain a bit about that? And also, you locate your biography that you've written into it, because, of course, this is the first time her story has ever been told. In the 1930s, when she was in her 70s, she decided that her works should not be, she actually says, should not be opened until 20 years after her death. And that's more or less what happened after she died in 1944. Everything was inherited by her nephew and stored in Stockholm. And he waited for 20 years. He was also then he retired. (laughs) Good coincidence. And then he had time to find a way to promote his aunt's work. He set up a foundation. And then I think The milestone exhibition that happened was in 1986, which was called The Spiritual in Abstract Art. It was shown in Los Angeles. And that was for the first time where paintings by her hung alongside works by Mondrian, by Kandinsky and the like. And she was kind of claimed as a pioneer of abstraction. But she got devastating reviews. And then for a long time, she was shown in rather smaller museums and smaller exhibition spaces. And I think, although all these exhibitions were very important, and I think particularly the Swedish and the Scandinavian people saw many more exhibitions before the big Moderna Museum exhibition in 2013, I think the importance of that exhibition in Stockholm cannot be underestimated because it was done by a large institution it was done with a wonderful catalog and also with the claim hammer of Clint, a pioneer of abstraction. And that was important. That was kind of the bell that had to be rung. And I remember the first time I bumped into paintings by her in 2008, when I was still a journalist with Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. And I was in awe and I was happy and I was shocked at the same time because I felt, you know, how can this be? These are beautiful paintings, wonderful thing. But how come I have never heard of this person before? I guess in Sweden, there were more people who would know her name, but in my environment, there was nobody who had heard of Hilma Abklin. So then I decided I would like to know more about her. And the best opportunity I got was in 2016, where I was invited to a place in Berlin, which is Institute of Advanced Studies. And that enabled me to go to Sweden and go to the archive, where I went together with the grand nephew, Johan Abklin. And we you know, looked together through the notebooks and everything, and all kind of sort of unexplicable stuff came up. Things like a notebook from Italy, where does that come from, and so forth. So I started researching, and I really felt, oh, wow, this person is completely underestimated. As you said, that's often the case with women. On the one hand, there's the stereotype. People say, oh, it should only be about the work, and it shouldn't be about the biography, and it shouldn't be about the life. And then they don't tell sort of female lives. And after a while, everybody thinks, oh, there's nothing to tell because she always stayed in the same country. She wasn't interested in anything and she wasn't connected to anything interesting. And then they absolutely underestimate the work this person has done. So I was happy to discover that she traveled to Italy, for example, which is a big sign, A, that she was a very modern woman. On the other, she traveled there around 1902, 1903, probably. And also that she was interested in art and where it came from and all kinds of things. So she was an open, adventurous, modern woman who would go to the movies, who would take public transport, who would embrace all kinds of modern inventions. For example, even when she's approaching her 80s and she's still talking in letters about the best way to present her paintings when she gives a lecture and she talks about projecting them and so forth. I mean, this is wonderful. I thought that often the link between work and art and biography, particularly in the case of women, is underestimated. And that in a way we have to have a roadmap in order to follow all the different paths this person took and all the different things she was connected to. And from then on, we can explore the whole universe of that person. But we have to know more about this person in order to estimate in what direction we can do research. And so in that context, 
Do you think that pioneer of abstraction, as she's dubbed, is that an oversimplification? And, you know, this kind of revision of the abstract artist's legacy and sort of the bumping of Wassily Kandinsky, who sort of dubbed the grandfather of abstraction. Is this too simple of a take? Yes, <laughs> it is. But at the same time, I think it's a good point to start. Abstraction is not a word Hilma of Klint uses. I mean, it's a word Kandinsky uses a lot, but Hilma of Klint almost never in her notebooks. And the word she would use is spiritual, also a word that Kandinsky uses. And I think for her, abstraction is kind of the natural expression of the spiritual, of these invisible forces that surround us. And still, I would maintain that as we encounter them, loads of them are abstract paintings. And I think the category is still fine. And it's also useful to use it in order to look at Kandinsky's painting, for example, because I think the whole story of abstraction was kind of twisted and retold and turned into something else in the years of the Cold War. Because then abstraction was defined as a style, not as the expression of a movement. And I think for Kandinsky and Hilma Afklint, it was a movement. The art was something that would sort of help to turn this world, society, into something else and would be an expression of something we should be aware of in order to make this world very simplistic, let's say, turn it into a better place. So I think abstraction is still a good category, but we have to retell the story and sort of get rid of this kind of Cold War single male genus notion that it was attached to and also stop thinking about as abstractions just as a style. It's not only a style, it's the expression of a movement. Hmm. And also for Hema Afklint, I think it's a lot of different things. Her paintings, they're messages. They contain biographical information. Also in the paintings, you can find all kinds of allusions to Anna Cassel, for example, or to other friends. There are symbols, there are diagrams, there are abstractions. And at the same time, there are also portals. There are something that should help us to enter this world she is experiencing. Like in the science fiction movie, it's doors that open to another world. And there are all these things at the same time. So I think it's good to start from abstraction, but we shouldn't stop there. A catalogue raisonné has coming out in March, as I understand it, and it looks enormous. And of course, abstraction, as you say, is just one part of her practice. There was figurative watercolors at the end and figurative paintings at the beginning and all kinds of things in between. It really captures all the distinct phases of her practice. I'm curious, what revelations have come up through the catalogue raisonné? Because I know you're close with Daniel Birnbaum, who is co-editing the catalogue raisonné right now. The Catalogue Resume is an absolute beautiful publication and it's very well done. It's edited by Daniel Birnbaum, with whom I will be curating a show on Kandinsky and Hilma Afklint that will come next year. And also by Kurt Einquist, and they have done it together. I think it's absolutely breathtaking to see everything in a row because that's very difficult to represent in catalogues, for example. Ever since 1906, Hilma Afklint started working in series. So every painting is part of a larger cycle. And then these series often sort of are pieces of a puzzle of a larger series. So it's tremendous work and it's difficult to be shown in exhibitions because it need, needs so much space. And it's also difficult to be shown in catalogues because it needs so much space. So the catalog resume is the first opportunity to really file through series after series and see that all together, which is beautiful. I think it's also a wonderful way of discovering that she moves in and out of abstraction. So she might start with something like the swan, which is a representative painting, and then move on to something completely and purely abstract, and then again return to something which is representative. And I think this kind of flow can only be seen in the catalog resume. There are beautiful paintings also in the last catalog resume, which is volume seven, and I had the honor of contributing a afterwards to it. That's a real discovery that, yes. <laughs> so there is a series which has only been recently discovered. It came out in Dorna, Switzerland, and it looks like Hilma of Klint had given it originally in the 1920s to the Goetheanum, the place that was built by Rudolf Steiner and run by the Anthroposophical Society. And she gave it to Steiner and the Anthroposophical Society, hoping that they would put it on display, and they didn't. And 
how it sort of went out of the Goethe Anum, I don't know, but it was kept in private hands for a long time and was recently sold to the Museum of Modern Art. And it's 44 watercolors, beautiful watercolors, and they combine abstract diagrams with absolutely stunning botanical illustrations. Wonderful. And actually, it's the first time you can see them in this catalogue raisonnée. It says in the catalogue raisonnée that they are now owned by the Museum of Modern Art in New York, but I think a lot of people haven't realized yet. Wow, okay. And you're working on an exhibition of Kandinsky and Afklint, which should be very exciting. That's also the first time that those two artists are going to be presented together. Is that right? Yes, the exhibition I mentioned in 1986 in Los Angeles on the spiritual and abstract art, there were paintings by Kandinsky and Hilma Afklint, but also by Mondrian and Levitch and so forth. But I think it's the very first time that only Kandinsky and Afklint are put together in one exhibition. And that's very exciting to work on it. I worked together with Daniel Birnbaum, we both think it's one of the most exciting things you can do right now. I'm curious, because she has become so posthumously famous, what the market is like for her work. I mean, the bulk of her work is in the estates. Is there some sort of backroom infighting going on to collaborate with her estate that you know of? Or is there like some works that have been bought up at auction and disappeared into private collections? So I wonder how all of that is playing out. You're right. The bulk of the work belongs to the foundation and belongs to the estate. And I guess a lot of galleries would be very happy if they could represent the estate and sell things. But so far, the estate hasn't sold anything. And I think also legally, the cycle paintings for the temple could not be sold. I think this is something Hilma Abklint made clear in her testament, and nobody ever thought about touching you're also right. There are things that come up on the market. There hasn't been a market for decades. There are all kinds of incidents where watercolors had turned up and they were sold for 2,000, 3,000, almost nothing. Wow. But I think it was in 2019 or 20 where one of her watercolors was suddenly sold for a million euro. So I think it was clear it was after the Guggenheim exhibition and that sort of now all kind of collectors were willing to pay a lot of money in order to get an original Hema of Tint, which is a very rare thing to buy. The two series that came up on the market was Tree of Knowledge, which she did from 1913 to 1915. And she did it in two editions. One, again, was given originally from her to Donna to the Gutianum, to Rudolf Steiner. And it came up on the market and was sold to David Zerner in New York. It was also shown in a beautiful exhibition. It produced a catalog that will be published later this year. And it was sold to a private museum, to the Glenstone Museum, close to Washington. And then the other series is the one I just mentioned, which consists of 44 watercolors and was sold to the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And this is also a series that had not been known before. Only then, when these paintings came up, I realized that one of the notebooks was actually a catalog of these works. And before I thought, you know, what is this about? I don't know. But because there are so many notebooks, it's not like everything makes sense. So before that, I didn't really pay attention to that book. And only when the series came up and I went to Donut in order to look at the watercolors, I realized that one of the notebooks is actually a complete catalog of these beautiful and stunning works. And they were also sold in a private deal. I just wanted to again say that it's a really fascinating biography and I would encourage everyone to read it and learn more about the nuances of this rapidly ascending star. But I also wanted to ask you just as we close out that it really struck me, I think the futuristic visions of F. Clint, they really resonate with the present moment in the advent of AI and the metaverse and the sort of techno-mystical vibes and the questions that all of these new technologies present. It just makes me feel that it's not just about an overlooked artist being discovered, mm -hmm. but there is something about her work that is really meeting the present moment. Do you agree yeah. with that? And could you share a comment about her relevance to this moment that we're living through? I would absolutely agree. I think that's the beauty of it. We might not believe in mystics, but I think a lot of people would agree that there's something very futuristic and almost clairvoyant in her paintings. And that is kind of, I don't know, exciting and also a bit spooky, maybe. It's her attitude towards everything that's too rigid. Her idea that everything sort of needs to change. And I think the movement in her paintings, it's always about 
connecting and then changing. And it's an ongoing movement. It's not like you're replacing an old system with a new rigid system, but it's saying, no, everything has to change and keep on changing. And I think we are now very much more open to the idea that there are spiritual forces that might not be categorized with the large world religions. I think we are open to that. And we are also relieved if someone is not part of that system, maybe also to a degree. Then a lot of people embrace the idea that gender categories and all these things should be overcome. It's fascinating to see a person who lived by her own rules and had sort of queer community long before this term was even coined. And also, I think a liberty to move across gender identities, to move in time. There are also things she talks about incarnations and that she was a king in some ancient times and her friend was a warrior and all that. It's so beautiful and vibrant and there's so much to discover. So I'm absolutely sure she will keep on surprising us. I'm sure too. I'm sure that your biography and the catalog resume and all this new research is going to spawn more people to look into her legacy and discover even more about it. Yes, absolutely. I think so too. There are a lot of things going on already. And I think also what's interesting to see with her work that it resonates not only with Western culture. So she was shown in Brazil, for example, and a lot of people felt like they could relate to it because there's a lot sort of talking about animal and plant spirits, for example, that resonates with a lot of pantheistic spiritual worldviews and so forth. And I think it will be exciting to see how different cultures deal with her work and explore her work and also find out new things about her. Yeah, I can't wait to observe that as well. Thank you so much, Julia. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Thank you for joining me on Art Angle today. Thank you so much, Kate. That was excellent. Thank you. That's it for this week's episode. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, take a moment to rate and review us. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. The Art Angle is produced by Sonia Manalili, Carolyn Goldstein, and Tim Schneider. Thanks for listening and see you next week.